as we are. Good morning, everybody. And so I will speak about uh, fluid responsiveness and fluid challenges and uh, what everyone needs to know about that. And before starting my presentation, I disclose that I'm a member of the Medical Advisory Board of uh, McKay. I think that uh, among the important messages, the first one is likely that fluid overload is definitely harmful in patients with sepsis and with areas. You all know that, but keep in mind that really demonstrated today, and many studies today demonstrate that overloading our patients with sepsis, with areas, kills our patients. For instance, just two studies to illustrate that. The SOAP cohort, you remember, more than 3,000 patients. The cumulative fluid balance was an independent predictor of mortality. The more you fund these patients, the more they die. The same in areas. For instance, in this study we conducted in 200 arts patients, again, the cumulative fluid balance increased mortality independently from the other uh, uh, markers of severity. Fluid overload increases the mortality of a areas patients. And so it means that we should uh, develop all the possible efforts to reduce the amount of fluid we give to our, uh, our ICU sepsis and EADS patients. The second fact is that volume expansion in constantly results in the increase in cardiac output that one expected before uh, giving it. And this is basically due to a physiology. And it's the concept of uh, fluid responsiveness you likely know and this relationship between stroke volume and cardiac preload. When we give fluid to a patient, we expect that stroke volume will increase, but the relationship between both stroke volume and preload is curvilinear, is the frank starling relationship. And even more, the slope of the relationship is not constant since it varies with the ventricular function. And so it explains why, the basic physiology explains why the same volume expansion with the same increase in preload could induce a positive or a negligible increase in stroke volume. In other words, all patients do not respond to fluid administration. Then, of course, the next logical question is how to predict fluid responsiveness. The wrong way was used for many years, and you know that the wrong way, at least in my mind, and uh, Anders uh, Werner is going perhaps to convince me that uh, I'm wrong, but was to use central venous pressure. And the idea was uh, quite simple. If CVP is low, give fluid. If CVP is high, refrain from fluid administration. But the problem is that it doesn't work. And the main reason is the basic physiology again. Because you see here on this figure that obviously a given value of CVP, a static marker of preload, is not indicative of fluid responsiveness. Again, this is due to the basic physiology and it's been <coughs> demonstrated by many studies. And just to illustrate that, look at this meta-analysis of uh, Marik uh, and uh, Cavaladzi here. 43 studies leading to the conclusion that there are no data to support the widespread, pra the widespread spread practice of using CVP to guide fluid therapy. This approach to fluid resuscitation should be abandoned. So this is due to physiology and it's well demonstrated. I don't know how it's possible still today to use CVP to predict fluid responsiveness. Measuring CVP for many other reasons is likely reasonable but it's not for telling you anything about fluid responsiveness. Then, how to do? The possi uh, possibility may come for the common fluid challenge, as, for instance, recommended by the last version of the surviving sepsis campaign. What does it consist in, in fact? Give 500 milliliters of fluid and see what happens and how cardiac output changes. It means that you give... Uh, 500 milliliters of fluid to your patient, you look at cardiac output. If it increases, you go on with fluid administration until the last volume that does not increase cardiac output anymore. And 
actually, obviously, it's a good way to predict rate responsiveness. It's reliable. But the problem is that if you think about a patient with a septic shock on first day, and you know that this patient will have perhaps uh, five or four episodes of hypertension. So it means that by constitution, at the end of the day, your patient will have received not less than two liters of fluid while it did not increase cardiac output. This is obviously fluid overload. And that's why perhaps the fluid challenge can be used in patients without ARDS or patients in the operating room, but in those patients in whom the risk of excessive fluid administration is high, I think that we need some other ways to predict fluid responsiveness without giving any drops of fluid. If it's not the CVP, perhaps we could uh, use the uh, dynamic parameters and first the respiratory variation of stroke volume and arterial pulse pressure. In fact, the principle behind is to use mechanical ventilation to test the frank studding curve at the bedside. Because we know that during mechanical ventilation, each insufflation impedes the venous return, meaning that mechanical ventilation is associated with a cyclic change in the cardiac preload then to test fluid responsiveness, just look at the results on stroke volume or perhaps pulse pressure. And if mechanical ventilation is associated with no change in arterial pulse pressure, your patient is likely fluid unresponsive, while if you observe large changes in pulse pressure during mechanical ventilation, then it's very likely your patient is fluid responsive. And, uh, Actually, the first message is that pulse pressure variation is reliable to predict fluid responsiveness. But the second message that must always be kept in mind at the bedside is that there are some limitations, some situations in which it is not possible to use pulse pressure stroke volume variation to uh, predict fluid responsiveness. In case of spontaneous breathing activity, because of the irregularity of the uh, respiration, of course. In case of cardiac arrhythmias, because again, the changes in pulse pressure is due to arrhythmia itself, not to fluid responsiveness. But also in case of ARDS, because of the first, because first of the low tidal volume, which is not enough to create the changes in pulse pressure. And also in case of flow lung compliance, because the rigidity of the lungs uh, uh, um, uh, prevents the changes in alveolar pressure to be transmitted to the vessels. The problem is that you will agree with me that these situations are quite common in the ICU, not in the operating room, but in the ICU. And it means that in such instances, in patients with arrhythmias, spontaneous ventilation, ARDS, we need something else to uh, uh, test fluid responsiveness. One solution may be to use another dynamic test using mechanical ventilation, which is the end expiratory occlusion test. In fact, this test is, uh, is based on the principle, again, that each insufflation during mechanical ventilation induces an, in, an impediment in venous return. Venous return tends to grow up and then the next insufflation interrupts venous return. And so it means that if you stop mechanical ventilation at end expiration, just like for measuring the intrinsic PEEP, it means that you stop the cyclic impediment in venous return. You allow, you allow for a few seconds the cardiac preload to increase. It's like a preload challenge. And if in response you observe an increase in cardiac output, it's very likely that your patient will positively respond to the fluid you're going to administer. This is what we demonstrated at least in this study and we observed that if cardiac index increased by more than 5% during a 15 second and expiratory occlusion, we could predict responsiveness with a good sensitivity and a very good specificity.
It's quite easy to uh, perform if you have a continuous measurement of cardiac output because then you just have to press the button of the end expiratory occlusion on any ventilators and observe the changes of the continuous value of cardiac index here. You see that uh, the increase here is induced by the uh, uh, occlusion at end expiration of mechanical ventilation. If it's larger than 5%, your patient is fluid responsive. There are some limitations. The first could be the PEEP level because, of course, you reduce the uh, alveolar pressure to the PEEP level. But, in fact, it's likely not the case, at least if you look at your, the results of this study we performed uh, four years after the first one, and in which we showed that the uh, area under the rock curve for the prediction by the EEO test was as good at 5 than at 14 centimeters of water. So likely in this range, in these uh, ranges of uh, PEEP, the uh, EEO test kept uh, its uh, reliability. Now, of course, it's not possible to use it in non-intubated patients. Also in patients who cannot sustain a 15-second end expiratory hold, and this duration of the hold is, uh, is uh, important. It must be as long as 15 seconds. And uh, as I uh, said before, it's easy to perform if you have a continuous measurement of cardiac output, as for instance with pulse control analysis. But uh, perhaps it's possible to use it uh, with the echocardiography and etc. Another possibility may come from the passive leg uh, raising test, and you likely know that uh, this test has been developed to predeclude responsiveness because it's obvious that if you move a patient to a passive leg raised position at 45 degrees, you move some blood from the legs, but also, and that's likely very important, from the, summary, from the, um, from the splanchnic compartment toward the cardiac cavities. And that's why it's important to start from the summer recumbent position. In other words, passive leg raising is like a self and endogenous fluid challenge. Many studies that um, uh, showed that it's reliable and we uh, recently showed also that it actually increases preload by increasing the mean systemic pressure which is the backward pressure of the of the venous return. It's been published uh, just uh, uh, during the last days in critical care and we showed that during the past flag raising we observed a change in the mean systemic pressure as well as did the volume expansion here and this induced a significant increase in the pressure gradient of venous return, as did also volume expansion, meaning that the hemodynamic changes induced by the passive leg raising test are significant enough to increase the cardiac preload. Of course, the interest of the study is that it's, uh, it takes place over several cardiac cycles and several respiratory cycles, explaining why it remains valid in case of spontaneous breathing and in case of cardiac arrhythmias. Since the first publication, many studies have been published confirming the reliability of the test, and we recently performed a meta-analysis with uh, Jean-Louis Teboul and Paul Marek. It's been published uh, uh, last week in intensive care medicine, and you see that in almost uh, 1,000 fluid challenges, the reliability of the test was actually very good. This test is definitely reliable to test uh, fluid responsiveness. And by the way, you know that it's been included in the recent revision of the uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign guidelines uh, 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 recommending to perform a fluid challenge. We've seen how it can be problematic in patients with ERAS, but also dynamic assessment of fluid responsiveness with the passive leg uh, raise. A few weeks ago, a few months ago, we uh, published this uh, editorial with jean louis Taboul in Critical Care insisting on the rules that must be uh, respected in order to perform the passive leg raising test. And here, it's likely one of the most important one you must assess the effects of the passive leg raising by a direct measurement of cardiac output. It means that it's not possible to assess it with a simple measurement of blood pressure at the bedside monitor. Because if you do so, and this is what we showed in this uh, meta-analysis as uh, demonstrated by uh, some studies, 
he had a, a very poor sensitivity. It means, and actually it's the main drawback of the test, you need something that measures cardiac output, whatever the technique. Echo was used in many studies, can be the Pico, the Vigilio, many uh, techniques, but you cannot do it simply with the uh, blood pressure. So it means usually that you have, uh, you need a an estimation and sometimes, sometimes an invasive way to measure a cardiac output, even though in this study, for instance, we showed that, that it's possible to assess the test with a simple measurement of the entitled CO2. And you know that in patients with very stable ventilation, the entitled CO2 you measure at the tip of the, uh, uh, of the tube, of the tracheal tube, is proportional to the changes in cardiac output. And so that's why we showed in this study that actually if you observe an increase in ETCO2 during volume expansion and actually it indicates that cardiac output increases, you can observe a similar increase during the past plague raising test. And the reliability of the prediction was very good, as good as for a direct measurement of cardiac output and much better than if the effects of the PLR test were assessed on the pulse pressure. So it's a non-invasive way to assess the passive leg raising test, but of course it can be used only in patients who are intubated and with very stable uh, mechanical uh, ventilation. What are the uh, drawbacks of the test? Uh, as I said again, you need something that measures cardiac output directly. Of course, it's not reasonable to use it in case of intracranial hypertension. Likely it's not suitable for the operating room, and there is the question of uh, intra-abdominal hypertension. And some authors suggested that it's a limitation of the pass plague raising test. In fact, it's in this study. And look at the design of this study. In fact, the authors here included patients who all responded to uh, fluid administration. And they observed that in these responders, there were some false positives. And they observed that in these false positives, the passive leg raising was negative. And so they concluded that intra-abdominal hypertension creates some false negatives. And they uh, suggested, as it was uh, underlined in this abstract here uh, by uh, Manu Malbrain and uh, Daniel Reiter, that it's due perhaps to the compression of the abdomen uh, by the, intra of the uh, inferior vena cava. Nevertheless, I think that we must be very careful with this conclusion because, as you pointed out, uh, Daniel and Manu, in this study, they did not measure the intra-abdominal hypertension during the passive leg raising test, while it may, in contrast, decrease the intra-abdominal pressure by relieving the weight of the diaphragm. And so I think that at least it needs more uh, validation to show that actually it's a limitation of the test and some, uh, more, uh, some better studies to demonstrate it. I'm not sure that it's a limitation to the passive leg raising test. So it's something you could use to test fluid responsiveness. Passive leg raising and anti-expiratory occlusion tests are reliable indicators of fluid responsiveness. Thank you very much for your attention.